Hello and welcome to The Site Beyond. I'm your host, Sats Chan. And today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Sean Jacobson, who has lived a very interesting and successful life without having the ability to see. Sean, welcome. Thank you. Thank now, you very much. Now, just, uh, it's, it's obviously you, you're partially blind, I'm told. Uh, and tell me about how growing up as a child, dealing with that obstacle of being partially blind, how did you adjust? Well, I mean, it was, the interesting thing about that was I don't remember a lot before going to school. I don't remember playing with a lot of kids, but when I went to school, it was the Iowa School for the Blind. Mm -hmm. We were all pretty much in the same condition. Some of us were totally blind. Some of us partially sighted. Uh, all the books were in Braille. You did your homework in Braille. You learned to read Braille. You learned to write it with a Braille writer and with a slate. Mm -hmm. We also had books that were recorded and at that time they were on records. Since then they've moved to tape and since then they've moved to the digital medium, mm -hmm. which is good because they're more convenient, but every time you change the medium, all the older books, you either have to Outdated, yeah. redo or you lose them. Understood. Uh, now, if I, if I may ask you a question that regards you in terms of education out there, um, obviously, you know, to be able to adjust to life, Education-wise, speaking out there in terms of experiences and what you to go through, did the, did the education system in our in our country or in society help you to adjust to life, living a life as a partially blind person, and, and how did it help you? I I think that the uh, being in the school helped me as far as getting to deal with other people, mm -hmm. and the one good thing about the institution was that first I was dealing with other blind people, so it was. Blindness wasn't the issue. You had to work on the other issues that we all have. Mm -hmm. but I think what a lot of people don't realize that if you're blind, once you deal with the blindness issues, you, mm -hmm. you're not there. Then you have to deal with what everyone else has to deal. The real with. life too. I mean, the other, you know, the normal life stuff as well too. Which, which uh, begs the question for me is, uh, obviously, you, you went to a school and you and you were, you know, there with a lot of uh, partially blind or blind people. When you stepped out go into normal society in terms of people who actually could see, was there an adjustment process for you there? Uh, very much so. Uh, for one thing, there was a whole lot more choice in classes when I got out into the regular high school and I learned what choosing your own class was about. The other thing too was when I, by the time I got out into the normal high school, I was a senior and mm -hmm. uh, different town than the school than the uh, school for the blind was at. So a lot of the kids I didn't know, it's like, okay, you're learning these people in a year and they've learned each other for 13 and then it's on to college which is even more huge and then the whole issue the one big issue was when I was at the school for the blind all the stuff was in Braille now you're in charge of or or my parents were in charge of getting the books into an accessible medium mm -hmm. and it meant working with the Iowa Commission for the Blind, working with other groups. When I was in college, we hired this one lady to do read, reading textbooks for me. I went into computer science for a while in college. Uh, debugging programs with mm -hmm. a reader took more patience than I had. Mm -hmm. uh, math books, trying to have a reader go over an equation for you 20 times. <laughs> is not fun uh, when I did get the books in Braille and then when I got the closed circuit reading machine later on, that helped a lot with the hard sciences and with math. And the uh, thing too to understand is the technology is different now. Now you've got a KNFB reader which... Yeah, what is that? What, tell me what a, what a KNFB reader is in 30 seconds or less. It t it's a machine that will scan print, uh -huh. take a picture of it, and then either put it into Braille or into voice. Okay. And so it allows I, you to basically, uh, uh, to, 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 I guess, to hear uh, print text. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Okay. And it opens up more print text than we had when I was growing up. Now, uh, talking about growing up in, in general, um, making friends, social aspect, you know, when you're not blind, it's, it's difficult as it is when you're a child, you know, learning, you know, who you yeah. are, what you have to do. Mm -hmm. What about someone who's partially blind? How difficult was it for you? What obstacles did you have to overcome there? Well, I think that when you're dealing with sighted children, you're not doing some of the sports they're doing, which makes it hard. You're not reading faces as well as a sighted person would, which makes it hard. Mm -hmm. 
you, you have to let them know, okay, I don't see your face. If I don't recognize you, it's not because I'm rude. It's because, okay, I could call you who I think you are. That might be wrong. That's also embarrassing. Got it. So uh, in terms of, uh, but not too many major obstacles, and you have those, those side pots, recognizing people, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of making friends, social group, was there ever a major issue for you there? Um, I grew up an only child. I was overprotected as a child because People didn't know better, so I had some issues, but they were not per se blindness related. Got it. Uh, not everything that, not every difficulty that a blind person has is going to result from uh, blindness. Some of it results from misconceptions about blindness. Some of it uh, uh, results from other Aspects qualities of, of your life, failings right. that we have in the sighted community and the able-bodied community. And so on that note, let's take a quick break here. Uh, we're going to take a short break and come back with more with Mr. Jacobson about his experiences with Sight Beyond. Don't go away. What is the difference between a photographer and a visual artist? Well, the difference is not a lot. To put it simply, I'm a visual artist. Okay? I, I use photography, but I use other means to express myself. Um, Montgomery Community Media offers many, many um, courses. Half the people getting to know these awesome people whom I work with and I'm learning with and great teachers and it's also like, oh, this is how TV works. When I'm watching shows like talk shows or even, you know, exercise shows, things like that, I look at it so differently. That kind of like, there is a guy sitting at a giant board filled with buttons just pushing them. That makes sense. We teach our students how to be the reporter, the shooter, and the editor for their very own news pieces. This is a good opportunity to learn about different ways of documentary and editing. My dad got an email from someone and he told me it was going to be a good opportunity to learn how to edit, shoot videos, and interview people. It's really good and you should come to MCM Backpack Journalism class because it's exciting and it's actually really fun. MCM to me means opportunity. Um, it's giving me the opportunity to gain experience on an actual show that airs on the network. Um, and I don't think I'll be able to get that experience anywhere else. So it's been a great, great experience for me so far. For anybody that hasn't taken a, one of the MCM classes, I, I encourage you, go out, try it, you won't regret it. You'll have an experience that you're gonna see how the cameras work and, you, and ox, actually an opportunity to be part of a video production. That's, that's what I would recommend anybody that's interested in MCM. And we're back speaking with Sean Jacobson, a man who's sharing experience today with us uh, dealing with, uh, with blindness, partial blindness, and experiences in life in general. Now let's talk about, uh, about work. What do you do for a living? I'm a mathematical statistician. Wow, now that involves a lot of, initial thought is a lot of, lot of sightseeing. How do you get around that? Um, mostly uh, I have uh, uh, in, uh, glasses that enlarge things. I use a closed circuit television to read. Mm -hmm. I uh, could do it in Braille if I needed to. There are people who use a uh, JAWS that speaks or a Braille setup or Zoom text that also enlarges. Uh, there are different ways to work around reading what's on the computer, what's in books, things like that. Now, you mentioned stats, and uh, you were telling me you know, off camera earlier that stats not just about visual looking at numbers. Your job is to tell a story. So what do you really do besides looking at numbers? You analyze, and, 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 and I do a lot of writing, if I, recall correctly, if I recall correctly, right? Yeah, I do a lot of technical writing, trying to write down what the numbers tell me. For a while, I worked on the Consumer Price Index, and the numbers weren't just numbers. They re represented prices of things people bought. Mm -hmm. 
and you were trying to tell the story about how much prices were increasing. You might see on the news that inflation is up th uh, five tenths of a percent in a month, and this is more than was expected. And then people start, if you really read past the first paragraph, you might see where somebody's drilling down and saying, okay, this increase was either due to apparel or it was due to food or it was due to energy or it was due to something or other. And that's what a statistician does, looks at these, analyzes it. There are different ways of doing statistics. There are tests to see if the difference is real or whether it looks like a trick of the numbers. There are ways to compute standard errors to know how precise your numbers are. There is sampling, which tries to make sure that what you're getting from the world as far as numbers is truly representative of what's out there. Mm -hmm. And when I grew up, I went into statistics because I was good with numbers. I was one of these people who could add figures, columns of figures in my head, yada, yada. I don't mm -hmm. do that anymore. Mm -hmm. The brain is not as nimble as it was, but today the computer does that. You're, okay. so, the com so the arithmetic grunt work is now done by a machine. <laughs> It's not done by you anymore, so. We're more automated now in that regards too, so that, that makes sense out there. Now, let's just talk about something else, uh, transportation. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you don't drive, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so how do you get to work? I take uh, the 53 bus line from Olney down to Glenmont, uh -huh. unless that bus doesn't show up, in which case I take it to Shady Grove, and then I take the red line down to Metro Center, and the orange line down to Smithsonian, and that's three blocks from where I work. Wow, and how long does the commute take you one way or one way? Each way, about two hours. So you're, you're actually traveling four hours a day just to get to work, is that correct? That is correct. That's and then, amazing. And then I did have to go before Montgomery County on a couple of hearings because they wanted to get rid of the 53 bus line, which was the only bus that got me within two mi uh, that came within two miles of my house. Wow. Now, uh, your opinion upon our current metro system and how, how they handle people like yourself who, uh, who need public transportation to get around? Uh, metro seemed to work better when I moved out here 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as accessibility and handling people, I, I think that Metro could do a little more, uh, more as far as humility, uh, understanding that other people have needs, that one size doesn't fit all try to work with the community rather than dictate to the community. That's a very interesting point. Now let's talk about something a little bit different here. Uh, personal life, your hobbies, you know, what do you do for hobbies? Do you like to go watch movies? I mean, uh, so watch sports, what do you do for a hobby and, and what, project, what projects are you involved in personally on your side on your own free time? I uh, do a lot of reading. I mm. watch some television, mostly sports, sometimes the country music videos. Uh, okay. Because at the end of the day, I really don't want to get into anything too mind challenging and kind of mind blown from the from the day. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife got me into doing latch hook rugs, which is you have a mat and then you put threads in it with a lat with a hooking tool. Mm -hmm. I do that. I do a lot of work with National Federation of the Blind. I'm treasurer for the Sligo Creek chapter, which is the chapter for Montgomery County and then for the state of Maryland. Wow. I'm in the uh, the National Federation of the Blind has its writers division, which is a bunch of us blind folk uh, writing and doing poetry and stories and articles and book reviews, just any kind of writing out there. And we'll have conference calls where we talk about craft. Wow. So that's a very, very, you know, long and detailed and, and uh, you know, very encompassed life out there. And I wish we could talk some more. We could talk for uh, probably hours out there. But we're out of time. Thanks for being here and joining us, uh, Mr. Jacobson, for your time. And thanks for joining us as well, too. We'll see you next time on The Side Beyond. I'm Suds Chan. Take care.